cause number PDO 75623, Whitney S. Villa versus the State of Texas. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Timothy Dunn, and I, along with my co-counsel, co Cody McCuller, uh, appear before you on behalf of the state of Texas, in this case arising out of an appeal brought by the Dallas County District Attorney. Uh, this is a case about this court's jurisdiction. It's jurisdiction to heal, hear appeals brought by the state when the state is the losing party in a county court uh, after a case originating in a municipal court of record. It also incidentally addresses how we look at the uh, code of Criminal Procedure and how that code interacts with other codes in state statutes uh, involving criminal conduct. In 1976, this court in the Walker case observed that it had jurisdiction over all cases except for cases involving small municipal, municipal fines. It was two years later that this court in spring recognized the constitutionality of municipal courts of record. The question is, has the legislature changed that? Uh, and I'm going to address that in two primary points. I'm going to address first what this court has already said on this issue. And then I'm going to address holistically looking at the statutes as they work together, uh, how the, the best way to interpret Chapter 30 is working with the Code of Criminal Procedure. And this is not the first time a Municipal Court of Record appe appeal has come to this court after the state's appeal from the county level court. In 2005, Judge Hervey wrote the Blankenship Opinion. Now in Blankenship, uh, the issue was whether or not section 44.01D of the Code of Criminal Procedure had been complied with. But in a footnote, uh, Judge Hervey noted that uh, we were here because 44.01A enabled the state to bring that appeal to the Court of Appeals, the Intermediate Court of Appeals, from the county level court after the state uh, did not prevail. And so we had a similar procedural analysis and the respondent has referred to that footnote as dicta and I believe the court's appeal below have referred to that footnote as dicta. But it's really an explanation of how the case got here. And, and given that you know, the court, is, as recently as this year in the McGuire case, has advised that it does not issue advisory opinions, and given that Blankenship was remanded to the Austin Court of Appeals, decided on the merits, appealed back to this court, and this court denied the petition for review, uh, the implication giving the court's obligation to address its own jurisdiction in any event, in any case before it, is that uh, those cases were decided properly, they were decided with jurisdiction that the state had under Article 44.01. Counsel? Yes, sir. Is your position that appellant means defendant, or is it something different? My position is that Chapter 30 is internally inconsistent on the usage of that term. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, uh, I believe, in my position is that Appellant means appellant in, in 027, uh, but it is not exclusive. Uh, 027 is a pathway to appeal to the Intermediate Courts of Appeal. 44.01 is another pathway to appeal to the Intermediate Courts of Appeal. They do not conflict with each other. Do, they do not act exclusive of each other. Uh, and if you look at the use of the term appellant, what happened in 1999 was that the legislature changed the word defendant, which it had existed since 1987, to appellant 19 times. And it's also added in point one four a the state has a right to appeal under 44.01. Now, it says that in A, and two subparts later in C, it says the state has a right to, the, excuse me, it says the appellant must perfect appeal by filing a motion for a new trial, which the state can never do under Article 45.040 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So what is granted in subpart A, the right to appeal, is taken away in subpart C. And so there's already an inconsistency within chapter 30 that exists. And so when you look at 3027, and you look at what 3027 is doing, uh, and you look at what the legislature knew based on the 1998 opinion this court issued in Alvarez, which said, you know, 4401 applies to any level of court. It's about the disposition. It's not about the trial court, which incidentally, the majority opinion below doesn't expressly say it disagrees with, but implicitly says so. Um, so basically the legislature just hit find and replace and did all. 
instead of going through and they didn't replace all of them there are a few defendant references still in there but most of the time like in 30.0021 it makes sense it's the appellant's brief is due whatever number of days it is after the court's mm -hmm. record is filed okay. that makes sense uh, 14c does not make sense because it tells the state to do things the state can't do if it's the appellant uh, and so given that the legislature is working off of the Alvarez opinion from 98 when it's making this amendment in 99 it knows that the state can appeal any level of court uh, when it's making this language substitution uh, if it wanted to divest the court of jurisdiction we know what the legislature says when it wants to do that you look at 4.03 it says the court of appeals the intermediate court of appeals jurisdiction and i believe the language is uh, shall not be construed to embrace or something substantially similar to that. Uh, if you look at this court's opinion in Ex Parte Golden, that's another great example of the language the legislature will use when it's trying to limit jurisdiction. That case looked at Article 11.14 and Article 11.07. The, uh, looking at Article 11.14, it said that's a procedural statute. It's not jurisdictional. But 11.07 says this court has jurisdiction if X, Y, and Z happen. And so it's talking about jurisdiction. It addresses jurisdiction. That's the language the legislature uses. It's the same standard the civil courts use. The Texas Supreme Court has said, uh, you know, you have to have clear and unambiguous waivers of, of, of jurisdiction for the legislature to do that. In Henry Golden, this court similarly said, the drafters will make the intent clear if it's going to limit jurisdiction. That language is not is simply not in 0027. And what's also interesting about the Alvarez opinion, and, and the reason what, what I want to bring up, is that the whole point of that opinion, and yes, it did say defendant at the time, was that the state, the, the holding that mandamus was improper was based upon the idea that the state did have an adequate remedy at law. It could appeal from the county level court to the intermediate court of appeals. Uh, and it also quoted the Morse decision out of El Paso. That decision you know, very plainly said, look, it doesn't make any sense for us to have non-municipal courts of record or non-courts of record that can go all the way to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which this court did in 2013 in the Cooper case. And it doesn't make sense for municipal courts of record to not also have that option when Municipal courts of record, and I think the Fort Worth Court of Appeals has said it in the Miser case, uh, that case is there, uh, the, the, the avenue is there, uh, courts of record, because we want to decrease the duplicity that was happening in the county level courts. Everyone was just going to municipal court, uh, appealing de novo to the county level courts, and they were being flooded with de novo, you know, classy trials. Uh, and that was the point of the, of the statutory remedy. And so when you combine that with what this court has said in the Reedus opinion, which was the opinion that noted that you know, the states under 4401, the reason that's there is so the state has you know, ac adequate and consistent and accurate uh, guidance on what the law is from the higher courts uh, and has, is clear what the law is, that's, that, that all funnels into the idea that uh, these statutes are meant to be viewed together, not separately, as both the Pew opinion and Fort Worth did and the majority opinion below did. Uh, so you just read 27 in isolation, say we stop there. The, the Pew court actually says 44.01 is superfluous at that point in time. We don't even have to look at the Code of Criminal Procedure. And since we don't even have to look there, we can just read this, read this statute and stop. But that's not what this court does. This court in Keller has said, in, in, consistent with uh, the reading law t treatise by Justice Scalia that's come out in the last decade, uh, we use the whole text canon when we're doing statutory construction in this state. We use the harmonious reading doctrine. We use the presumption that words within an act mean the same thing every time they're used. And that's what the Keller court said. And so if we apply those, you, those statutory canons of construction, and we're looking at the word appellant in 27, we have to look at how it's used otherwise in chapter 30. As noted, it's not exactly consistent, and so we need to look at the other statutes governing these appeals and see where they get us. When you do that, you look at 4401, it's consistent with 27, because as I noted, 27 is a route. 4401 is a route. They're not, they don't exclude each other, and the, the parade of horribles the courts of appeal below have, have thrown out there, that 44.02 is somehow a barrier that we should stay away from, really isn't the case, not only because of the final sentence of that, that section, 
But because uh, even if 4402 did apply, once again, it's consistent because it says the defendant can appeal. 4.03 says, well, the defendant can't appeal in these small municipal fine cases. And chapter 30 says it's the mirror of 4.03. It, it, it says exactly you can appeal unless it's what 4.03 excludes. And the practicalities of that make a lot of sense. Chapter 30 is for municipal courts of record. Municipal courts are the courts that are most likely to have pro se defendants. You're gonna have way more pro se defendants in municipal court than anywhere else. And so it's good that the legislature put a one-stop shop for them to look at in Chapter 30. I'm gonna yield the balance to my co-counsel, Mr. McCuller, and I will see you again on rebuttal. May it please the court. Cody McCuller, Mesquite City Attorney's Office, on behalf of the state. So we'd like to turn this argument somewhat to the real world implications of the Villa decision. That's where we were going there as we started talking about the pro se defendants. But when we're talking about the real world implications, we're essentially talking about the materially absurd results that come from the Villa decision adopting Pew, because that's ultimately what it did. And the dissent got it right. The dissent nails it head on. They apply a bit of a crazy test actually. In A, it is explicit. They do not say the state. We don't add anything. The legislature would have said something if they wanted to. In B, well, we're going to add for the legislature a caveat here. We're going to put a comma and say regarding procedure to B. Well, the provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure relating to direct appeals from a county or a district court apply to the appeal or to the Court of Appeals apply to the appeal doesn't just infer that. So they already have this weird test. And the dissent hits that head on and says, there's no need for the limitation and it's something that you're adding. The legislature <clears throat> didn't say that. But let's play that out for a second. The reason that they say that they have to add that sentence is because necessarily B would infer 4401, but then also 4402, which would lead to these enormous problems. Well. The dissent hits it head on, says no article 4403, but also within that, if you read just the context of 4402, the last sentence is, this article in no way affects appeals pursuant to article 4417 of this chapter. And what is 4417 of this chapter? Appeals from a municipal court to a county court, right? It's for all, it's for justice courts, municipal court, municipal court of records. They don't explore that language. Well, what does that mean, pursuant to? Does that mean just while it's conducted under? Wouldn't the legislature have said it? Does pursuant to mean arising from, deriving from? But that's a red herring. It's sort of distracting to our time here, but I just want to put that out there because if you put that out there, there's a construction that could happen here. If we didn't have A and 30.027 just read the provisions of the code and just, just be existed, where the state could appeal, but the defendant wouldn't have an unlimited right of appeal. They'd have no right of appeal because of the stated language of 4402. Well, how would we fix that? Well, we fix it with, by adding a provision that said, well, you can appeal a fine that's affirmed or you can appeal solely based on the constitutionality. That's what we have. That's 30.027. But because they endeavored in Pew and then ultimately Villa adopted that to say that we need to add language, we do need to talk actually about what that added language does, right? So. We're, we're arising here from Dallas County. Dallas County has two county courts of criminal appeals, tastefully named. They are co-equal courts. They are not concurrent jurisdiction. They're co-equal courts of assignment. I can be in court one just as readily as I can be in court two. And here's where the problems start to arise. If court one says, state, if you do X, this is material error that is reversible. And court two says, if you don't do X, this is a material error that is reversible. I'm caught in the crossroads here where I'm basically playing a two chamber roulette where I have to guess which court this is gonna be appealed to afterwards to put on the case if I'm at the trial court level. But Mesquite and Dallas County really shouldn't complain because if I'm in Plano, which is in Collin County, I have seven courts that it can be appealed to. I'm playing six chamber roulette with all six or with six of the seven loaded hoping that I get the one judge on appeal. That's a bit of a crazy way to do law. That seems like a system of jurisprudence that wouldn't work, but that's what Pew is inferring by adding that sentence, that that's necessarily what we have to have. But here's my favorite of the materially absurd results. If I'm from a municipal court 
not a municipal court of record, let's say Sunnyvale, it's on the border of Mesquite, and I have an identical case to Mesquite, we try them both, Mesquite tries them in the court of record, Sunnyvale tries them in the municipal court, and we both appeal, they can both go to court one, and court one can say to Mesquite, Mesquite, you didn't do X, so this is reversed, motion for new trial granted, and then can put in X, and the court of appeals can tell them, X is reversible, you're reversed, and we have a counterintuitive thing here where the court that is the binding review court for the state in the municipal court of records is enforcing a standard which the court of appeals then in turn reverses them on. But that doesn't change what that standard is for us. And there's nothing that prevents the court from continuing to enforce that standard. If there were something to prevent that, I don't think that Pew would have necessarily just thrown out Alvarez without reading the reading. But all you have to do is you just distinguish and you move on. Well, that's all the court, county court would have to say is, well, this doesn't infer what the court of appeals told me on X, so you're going to continue to do X. Well, that's a really crazy result because now you have a court enforcing a different standard than it has. It goes to the heart of what makes precedent binding. Well, what makes precedent binding is you guys review at each level and each step to tell the lower court what they're allowed to do. Well, this becomes the binding court. And the problem with the becoming the binding court is we're not just talking about some assault contacts that are class C or traffic as the uh, lowest court here, the county court at one said, this is more than your usual traffic citation. Well, actually it's a lot more than that. Legislatures are very much more nimble, or I'm sorry, the city council are very much more nimble than the legislature. They meet potentially weekly. They have a, a member setting that's typically a lot less than the legislature, which means they can pass laws more frequently. They can, enact those laws as class C misdemeanors, and then those are tested through the judicial review. However, this imbues in the county court at law, or the county court, criminal court of appeals, the final determination as to what is unconstitutional. But then it doesn't even do that, because 30.014 allows for multiple different courts based on this chain of what a county might have. So a county court at law could say one thing, while a county court of criminal appeals can say a different thing. That leads to a really chaotic system, right? And it seems like when you look at all this, you're really saying that the legislature intended, by not saying the language that they inferred that Q adds, in an act called the Uniform Municipal Court Records Act to create this uniformity where really the only uniformity is disparity. That is material absurd results. Thank you for your time and consideration of this issue. Did you reserve time for rebuttal? Oh, we did, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Madison McQuippie, and I'm here today with Bruce Anton on behalf of Whitney Villa, the respondent in this case. Now this case comes down to the issue of whether the state faces the same restrictions as the defendant. And now the state has argued to you that really it doesn't, that Article 44.01 dic dictates the state's right to appeal in these instances. But I'm here to argue today that that's incorrect. The Dallas and Fort Worth Court of Appeals have already concluded that that is not a correct interpretation of the section that's at issue here today, which is 3027 of the Texas Government Code. But we have a dissent too, don't we? Yes, you do, yeah. Judge. Indeed. In reality, though, appellant means the currently appealing party. And because this term is unambiguous, there's no need to turn to extra textual factors. Now, when this court interprets statutes, its goal is to effectuate the collective intent and purpose of the legislators that enacted the statute. And to do this, this court looks to the literal text and tries to determine its fair and objective meaning. And this is done in a two-step process. First, by looking at whether the term or phrase at issue, here the appellant, is it ambiguous and whether that interpretation Counsel, if the defendant had lost on the motion for trial not prevailed on his motion for trial would he be able to appeal to the court of appeals if miss via did not receive she, I'm sorry. sure if miss via did not receive a new trial would she be allowed to appeal to the court of appeals right in this case she would be because her fine exceeded a hundred dollars okay. correct 
And so, again, appellant means the currently appealing party. And now the state's approach is far too rigid. In this case, Ms. Villa was the defendant, and she was convicted in the Mesquite Municipal Court. After that, she appealed that decision to the Dallas County Criminal Court and became the appellant. Once she was granted a new trial, the state was dissatisfied with this result and then appealed that decision to the Dallas Court of Appeals, therefore becoming the appellant. The state's argument is that once someone becomes the appellant, you're the appellant throughout the whole case proceedings. And this means- Counsel, how do you reconcile that with the interpreta interpretation of 3014, where it refers to the appellant, but then requires a state, the state, if it's an appellant, to actually engage in things that the state can't actually do, like file a motion for trial? Sure. I think that 3014, that statute specifically is dealing with appeals from the municipal court judgment to the county court level. Mm -hmm. The statute that we're focused on today, 27, is dealing only with appeals to the court of appeals. So from the county court level to the, the court of appeals. And so, again, I think that just because someone's the appellant at that first instance, that first appeal, um, that appellant can then later change. Again, it means the currently appealing party. And both the Dallas and Fort Worth Court of Appeals have reached this conclusion. Sometimes we have cases that go through the courts of appeals where a defendant is the appellant and the state is the appellee. And then somebody, the state perhaps loses and seeks to get review in this court. Do we call in this court the state? Do we call the state in this court the appellant? Or do we call them the appellee when they're, this, when they're bringing their case to yet a higher appellate court? They started out as the appellee in the Court of Appeals. Are they still the appellee when they come to our court? I believe they would be the petitioner and, and really the petitioner in okay. this court. And again, this... this I'm kind of reflecting on our, pra our practice. I'm wondering what our practice has been because I wonder if that has any impact on what the use of the word appellant, right? If, if that has an implication upon who started the appeal to begin with, right? Which I think in these cases, you're typically coming from a court, typically coming from a, a, a municipal court to perhaps a county criminal court and of appeals. And you know, in that context, I think you have the state being in the posture of what we would call an appellee, right? Because he's, they're not the appealing party. They're the responding party. And I wonder if the, the legislature, when they're writing the word appellant, if they're thinking about the state being an appellee at that point, not an appellant, so that they're not really referring. Are you following me? I mean, I hope I'm not just butchering this whole thing. I'm trying to figure it out. I, I understand your yeah. question. And I think what's unusual here and, and what's the, the difficulties is that typically there's not two intermediary appellate courts. Typically it goes from the district court to the court of appeals and then to this court. This is such an unusual circumstance and there's really no other instance where this occurs where we have these two levels. To answer your question, no, I don't believe that once the appellant once the appellant is the appellant that they are stuck in that with that label the whole time i think that these labels are even how they're used every single day you, you are the appellant and then you can become the petitioner um, or the state can become the petitioner while these terms are fluid in who is able to fit that label i also don't think that that means that the term appellant is ambiguous i still believe that appellant means the currently appealing party. Counsel, is your position that the state's right to appeal is basically just limited to anything from a municipal court of record to the county court and it doesn't go beyond that? No. Okay. My position is that, um, sure, there are some restrictions in section 27A, but there is a possibility for the state to appeal um, in this section. For instance, subsection A2 permits appeals when the constitutionality of the statute or ordinance is at issue. So in that instance, a defendant could be convicted 
at the Municipal Court of Record, appeal that conviction, be granted a new trial, and then the state, as the appellant, could then appeal that issue to the Court of Appeals, and under this section would have the right to appeal to do so. And so while- So a motion to quash. The state could appeal a motion to quash on unconstitutionality issue. For a motion to quash, no. Because in that instance, the, the statute dictates that there needs to be a conviction before they can appeal. So for a motion to quash, um, that procedure, that would not work. Don't you think that sets up some inconsistencies in larger counties when there's the potential of municipal court cases going to different county courts? And you have different judges ruling differently on the law. So how is a municipality supposed to know what to do? Sure. I, I mean, I would say that that's what happens in courts all the time. You know, you hope to get to certain judges or you hope to reach a certain court with a favorable panel. I think that that's not a, an atypical issue. And well, it's not atypical because ultimately you have a high court who can chime in on that and, and clarify any inconsistencies with the lower appellate courts. Sure, but I still believe that in this instance, as the Dallas and Fort Worth Court of Appeals have also concluded, there's still an opportunity for this court or the, Dallas, or the Court of Appeals to resolve these issues. There's still a channel. Even if the state is restricted in what appeals it could bring, there's still an opportunity to do so. But the restriction you construe uh, 30027 a in the manner that the majority did, and I guess you're relying on, then the Court of Criminal Appeals would not be the court of last resort. And you talk about how we look at things. Well, you know, if, if it doesn't get up here, we're not looking at things. So um, I don't understand that, <coughs> cutting us out in that that's not proper. Sure. I don't think that that's the case. I think that there are um, opportunities for this court to review these cases as a case of last resort. It just needs to go through the channels in this pretty particular section. Greatly limited. Okay. Greatly limited. And the state is dissatisfied with this and the defense is also limited. For example, an individual convicted in the municipal court of record, um, but the jury only imposes a $50 fine. Well, they're not able to have the right to appeal in those instances either. But even though that's the case, this does not necessarily lead to absurd results like the state is um, arguing here today. Again, because there's still opportunities. The right to appeal is not a privilege, it's a right. And so even if the channels provided in section 27a um, may be used infrequently that does not make them unfathomable or absurd additionally the case, the state has brought up some cases that it relies on as evidence that this court has already um, stamped its approval of jurisdiction um, under article 44.01 in these instances and so quickly taking a, a look at these cases State versus Blankenship, and that's that 2004 opinion out of this court. Um, this court only referenced Article 44.01A in a, in a footnote. The issue in that case was whether the county attorney made the appeal, which is a special process and procedure outlined in Article 44.01D. So any reference to the state's right to appeal under Article 44.01 seems to be just dicta there. And turning to Alvarez versus the Eighth Court of Appeals, that's that 1998 decision out of this court. Um, really, that case is not persuasive or authoritative here because it was decided a year before the 1999 amendments that changed the statute. And so that doesn't seem authoritative or binding here. And so turning to look at the extra textual factors, the second prong in the statutory interpretation analysis. Um, the, big, the big thing that's, um, that the statute has is the 1999 amendments, just like I stated. And 
in that amendment, the legislature changed the terminology from the defendant has the right to appeal to the appellant, the appellant. So, yeah, I want to, maybe you're going to address this already, Please. but I'm curious what other things they did in that same uh, bill, right? Is there a theme of something they were trying to accomplish there? It, it seems like they tried to broaden these statutes to include the state. Um, there were most of the instances where the defendant was used previously, that was changed to the appellant. Um, and then there was also some renumbering. So that's really the, the gist of that um, change. And so, again, the state argues though that Article 44.0 run is really its right to appeal in this instance. But from this amendment, we can see that the legislature intended to include the state or else it would have just left the statute as the defendant. That change has to have had a meaning or else they wouldn't have just changed that term. The state also points to subsection B of section 27 as proof that um, Article 44.01 and Article 44.02 and other provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure are really what's dictating this statute. If we, if we were to read it this way, however, it would make subsection A completely meaningless. In that instance, if Article 44.01 was to be read into the statute, well then this court would also presumably have to read in Article 44.02 which gives the defendant basically an unlimited right to appeal except in plea bargain cases. Again, what would be the point of that when we already have subsection A dictating when appeals are appropriate in this instance? Looking to another section in chapter 30, and again, chapter 30 is the governing structure for these municipal court of records. Looking to section 26, and that's the section detailing whether a, when a new trial is granted, the case stands as if it was granted in the municipal court. And again, that may be an odd statute. It really doesn't have to deal with, it really does not deal with appeals, however. And so that well, statute- isn't it, Counsel, isn't it odd though that under that statute it would seem like your reading would require the state to essentially file an appeal to the court that just granted a new trial? Agreed. So that seems kind of absurd, don't you think? I would not say it's absurd. I think it's an odd statute. I don't think that that interpretation or that weirdness should come into play when we're looking at 27, though. I still think in that section, what we're here for today, the appellant is the currently appealing party. Again, while that remedy may feel odd, who would want to go and appeal well, I mean, I, it just seems to me like if they're doing that, then why not? Call, why call it an appeal? Why not call it a motion to reconsider or something? Sure. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure on that section. I mean, I, I, I think that, yes, that is an odd statute with an odd remedy, but it's still, the state is still given a remedy to appeal that issue. And again, the right to appeal is not um, all-inclusive. I got to, I, I mean, you're still up there, so I want to, I want to, maybe this is a complete rabbit trail, and I hope it's not, but yes. I'm still concerned about this fluctuating title, right, appellee versus appellant, because if you have an appellant, if you have the defendant make an appeal to a county court of criminal appeals, then the defendant in that context is the appellant, right? So even if... The, at that point, at that stage of the game, that first appeal, the state would be the appellee in the hypothetical situation I'm describing. So why would the, the statute say, that, even if I'm trying to accept some of your arguments in order to just play them out, right? Why would they say that the appell change the name to appellant if they're talking about who are they talking about when they do that? Are they talking about the appellant in the County Criminal Court of Appeals or the appellant in the Court of Appeals? You see what I'm saying? There's a potential 
Is that addressed in the statutes at all? Do you have an answer to, to help me sort of resolve my struggle with that? Absolutely. I think it goes back to this weird two-level intermediary appellate system. Right. Again, my interpretation of the statute, which was the same interpretation as the Dallas and Fort Worth Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. the only lower court of appeals who have really examined and addressed this issue, is that the appellant is the currently appealing party. So in this statute, the state would be the appellant when it appealed to the Dallas Court of Appeals. But, but it, I'm wondering whether it can be because the way, I mean, take for example, this line from, uh, this is 30.00014, where they use the word appellant to perfect an appeal, the appellant. Mm -hmm. So the appellant has been, in the, at least in the County Criminal Court of Appeals, the defendant, right? And again, this is in my hypothetical scenario. It's, it is hard to figure this out. I mean, this is not an easy question, and, and I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is yet, but I'm still working to get there. Sure. So. Um, again, my response would be that the appellant is the currently appealing party, and when we're dealing with Section 14, the appellant in, in, in that statute refers to the individual, the party that's appealing to the county court level, which typically is the defendant. Of course, um, but can that- Can an appellee be an, become an appellant? Can an appellee become an appellant? Absolutely, yeah. I, absolutely. I, I don't see why they can't. Okay. Just like an, an appellee can become a respondent or a petitioner, there's no reason that these terms are fixed. Okay. Um, of course, they're labels, but they can change based on the case proceedings. And with my final minute, I just want to address one more of the state's points. Um, the, the state has argued that you know this is absurd results and that this issue will cause um, a lot of distress at the municipal court level. Um, my response is that this statute has been enacted for 25 years and it's only become an issue recently. And so there are dozens of cases referencing this statute where the defendant has not been able to um, appeal because they don't fit within the channels of Section 27A. Um, and, and unfortunately here, the state is dissatisfied that it is subject to these same statutes. So again, my closing remarks, appellant means the currently appealing party. It's not an ambiguous term, and there's no need to turn to the extra textual factors, but, that, but those support this reading as well. So I'd ask that this court affirm the lower court's judgment. Thank you. Your Honors, I'm going to briefly address uh, just a couple of points on rebuttal, if I may. <clears throat> we know from this court in the Murray case and the Robinson case that Article 44.01 was drawn to extend to the furthest reaches constitutionally permissible, mirroring the federal statute that grants the federal government those rights. There are some minority states that don't do that. Texas is in the majority. So the respondent you know, asserts we should look at Chapter 30, and, and we should read 27 as saying the currently appealing party. But if we look at Chapter 30, and we use what this court has said in Keller since 2005, that we use consistent usage, usage of the same term throughout an act, what does appellant mean? And Justice Yeary, you, you pointed it out. Appellant means the appellant in the county level court. And if we're gonna be consistent, and we're not gonna read, if we're, if we're concerned about reading words that the legislature didn't put there, there are no words in 27 that says the appellant to the court of appeals, uh, counsel used the phrase the currently appealing party, that would, that would have been more clear. It just says appellant. That word, counsel. Wait a second. Yes, Isn't the title of twenty seven appeal of the courts of appeals? It is, and, and if we're gonna if we're gonna look at the title, obviously, right, I understand yeah. that. But but the usage of the term in twenty seven does not clarify that appellant means something different. In you 27. would think that the title would clarify it for you, right? But it, but well, but but if you're gonna be consistent with the rest of chapter thirty, fair, that's a fair point, right? It, appellant always means the appellant in the county level court, and there's nothing in twenty seven that says we're changing what appellant means here. Uh, and so if that's what appellant means, and it still means appellant in the county level court, well, let's look at 27. Doesn't limit the appellees. 
opportunity to appeal. And if the state's the appellee under 4401, which extends to the furthest constitutionally permissible rights, the, the appellee can appeal, and it's the state, and it can go up under this other statute. It's a separate avenue of appeal. Uh, council also referenced uh, 27A2. They said that's a you know, narrow situation the state can go up. But 27A2 requires a conviction. It says there has to be a conviction there. It's the constitutionality upon which the conviction is based. If there's a new trial or a dismissal at the appellate level, there's not a conviction any longer. And so that statute, I find it difficult to read that statute as being applicable to the state ever either. And Justice Goldstein in her uh, dissent below noted that. The state really in a position, if we're just looking at 27, it's stuck. It can never appeal. And that is the position the statute was in when this court decided Alvarez in 1998. Because from 1987, when the legislature adopted municipal courts for anyone that wanted to create them, courts of record, it said defendant. And the, the Alvarez case said, well, yes, it says defendant, but the state can use 4401. The Pew Court, I believe, you know, sets that aside. It says, well, the, 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 the statute that was being dealt with in Alvarez said defendant, not the state. Uh, the state didn't have a right under 27 or Chapter 30 to appeal, and so it's different. But that's the same situation we're in now, if, if it means literally what it says. Uh, the state would ask that you reverse the Court of Appeals and remand for consideration of the appeal on the merits. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Council. Case is submitted. All rise.